in North America, we have a phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Unless you happen to be Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. He was the exact, exact opposite of his father. Let me give you a reason why some people hate Manasseh. According to tradition at the time of Jesus, it was Manasseh who took the aged prophet Isaiah, God's prophet, his father's friend and advisor, and he put that old man in a hollowed out log and had him cut in half. So when you read Hebrews 11, where it talks about they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, think of what Manasseh did to Isaiah the prophet. Manasseh restored all the horrible practices that his father had removed. He even put idols in the holy place. The, the one place in all the world where God chose to put his name, he filled it with idols. He restored the worship of Molech and he sacrificed his own children, his own sons. And then you think of his dad, Hezekiah would give anything just for one son and then for his son to disregard life and his own children in such a way. It's just horrible. We're told in 2 Kings 21, 3 and 4, who his role model was. 2 Kings 21, 3 and 4. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He reared up altars for Baal. He made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel. He worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, will I place my name. And then just to add on top of all this wickedness, he persecuted the followers of God. He literally filled Jerusalem with blood. If you're still in Kings, just go over to 21, verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till one end to the other. Beside his sin, wherewith he had made Judah to sin and doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And, and the picture, the horrible picture painted is, is almost as if you had gone out in the street after a rainstorm and you see puddles and little streams flowing along the curbs. But in this case, it was blood of the righteous. What a horrible man Manasseh was. Habakkuk, who was his prophet, paints a picture of life under Manasseh. In Habakkuk 1, verse 24, we read this. Habakkuk 1, verse 24, verses 2 and 4, sorry. Habakkuk 1, 2 and 4. So here's a prophet giving a firsthand account. O oh Lord. How long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Imagine 
having that as your daily life. Now, here's the thing. 12-year-olds growing up in Hezekiah's household, they don't think these things. And what it tells you right off the bat is how lasting, how pervasive that idol worship was. And, and even through Hezekiah's reign, there was pockets of apostasy, of idol worship that were still there, like embers in a fire that were not put out. And they flowed around Jerusalem. And when opportunity came, they drew in young Manasseh. And I suspect in the kingdom to come, it will be the same way. There will always be pockets of resistance, people just waiting for the chance to sin freely. Now, brothers and sisters, to be very blunt about this, if ever a king deserved to die, it was Manasseh. If you turn to 2 Chronicles 33, and we're going to pick out a few verses, starting with verse 2. 2 Chronicles 33. Verse 2. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So he was worse than the nations. And let's go down and look at verse 7. And he said, a carved image, the idol of which he had made in the house of God, which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name. And he put idols in it. Look at verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And in 2 Kings 21, verse 9, just one more to fill in the picture. 2 Kings 21, verse 9. But they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And as we just read in the previous verse in Chronicles, the king of Babylon comes and carries him off. You know, that sounds like Habakkuk's prayer was finally answered, that the believers who have been praying for relief finally had their prayer answered and Manasseh was removed, dragged through the thorns. And I think that has the idea that he was tortured and beat. You can imagine the joy that would fill the believers who were left in Jerusalem and Judah. You know, think about it. Imagine how happy you would be that this wicked man was finally removed. You would just be filled with joy. Good riddance. He's finally gone, right? I would think that. Wow, what a relief. Imagine just the unease, the nervousness of living in a world with, with Manasseh as the king. And then the oddest thing happens. The most unexpected thing occurs. Manasseh repents, and he's forgiven. In 2 Chronicles 33, if you want to just go back there, verses 12 and 13. And when he was in affliction, 
he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Who would have seen that happening? And you know, to the best of his ability, he tried to undo all the evil that he had caused in Jerusalem. If you look at 2 Chronicles 33, if you're still there, verses 15 through 17. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. And he cast them out of the city. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which implies that he had damaged it before. And then he sacrificed thereon peace offerings, thank offerings, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. So he tries to undo the evil he had done. Now, now you think of Manasseh. He was really as good as dead before his repentance. Again, in 2 Kings 21, verse 12, the parallel version, and I'll read it for you. 2 Kings 21, verse 12. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both of his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So when you think of that, what chance did Manasseh have? It was determined against him, the punishments that would come. And then the other question, and I know you know the answer, but it's just worth thinking about. Why on earth would God forgive Manasseh. What a difficult thing that would be. Well, you know, Manasseh believed. He knew that God was slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. And he also knew that as long as he was alive, there was hope. He was a young man when he took the throne, but he must have remembered that from the lessons that his father had taught him. Hezekiah had experienced the, the mercy and the love of God, and that lesson was conveyed to his son, and he remembered it. I actually remember a, a sis, sister now, but she wasn't. She was a young person that had come through our Sunday school for a little bit, and, and the family just simply stopped attending. She must have been early teens, was the last I ever saw her. And, and she, hope I'm not telling too much, but she dated somebody who was another religion, and they were going to get married. And, and then when she thought about what the marriage ceremony and everything would be like in the Catholic Church, she said, "Hun, this just isn't right. And she came back to the meeting, and she studied and was baptized, and then her husband was baptized. Now, these were lessons she learned as a young teenager, had left the truth completely, and then as a young adult remembered. It really is important what we teach our children. When Manasseh needed to remember that lesson, it was there. He remembered just when he needed it the most. Now, Manasseh is not unique. Paul the Apostle was once in a very similar position as Manasseh. I mean, at the end, Peter calls him our beloved brother Paul. 
But Saul of Tarsus laid waste the church. He killed many believers. He put them in prison. He actively was destroying God's ecclesia, just like Manasseh. But then Saul repents too. I'm going to read to you a passage from Ephesians, and I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified Version, because I think the Amplified in this case really fills in the richness of the verse. And it's just one verse. It's Ephesians 2, verse 5. But think about the full verse as is meant. Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, by his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you were saved, that you were delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. You know, brothers and sisters, sin is sin. And the wages of any sin is death. Now, I know it's hard for us to fathom, but we've all been in the same predicament as Manasseh of Jerusalem or Saul of Tarshish. We have all been sinful, rebellious creatures. And we sometimes forget that the wages of any sin is death, whether it's lying or coveting or slandering or adultery or, or any of Fill in the list. Sin is sin, and sin is worthy of death. Now, what I think is harder, and I think it really comes out when we think of Manasseh, is the idea of forgiveness. Matthew 6, verse 14. Matthew 6, verse 14 For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Are we as generous with our forgiveness in relation to the forgiveness we've received? Now, think about this. If you had lost your grandparents, your father, your mother, your brothers and sisters to the sword of Manasseh, could you possibly forgive him? That would be really tough, wouldn't it? But we need to. As the Lord has forgiven us, so we need to forgive. And it's a very difficult thing, but we are to forgive like our Father has forgiven us. And we have to be generous with our forgiveness. Now, forgiveness does have conditions, and it's worth just thinking about these for a minute. It's confession. And let me give you an example. A lot of times in my prayers, I will say, forgive my sins today, Lord, and then move on. I don't really think that's a very effective prayer, do you? I think it would be more effective in my personal prayers to God if I said, Lord, forgive me for doing this and that, and I was thinking wrongly about this, I was coveting that person's truck or, or, or whatever, but to be more specific with your sins. And you think, well, why? God knows what we've done wrong. But it's good to remind ourselves of our shortcomings. 
it's good to think over our shortcomings so we can try not to do it again. And when we hear ourselves talk about the things we've done wrong, I think it's helpful for us. It's not helpful for God. He knows. But for us to repeat these things is important. And so when you ask for forgiveness, try to be a little little more specific in your prayers. John, the Lord's friend, his best friend, as you might say, or a very close friend, the apostle, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can't doubt the power of forgiveness. And and if you ever doubt it, think of Manasseh. If you've ever thought you've done something that was unforgivable, think of Manasseh. If God could forgive him, he can forgive anything you've ever done. And we need to believe that. The other thing about Repentance is that you actually have to regret what you've done. Regret your actions. Try not to repeat it. We've we've talked about things this weekend about not repeating our sins and and fighting our sins. You just can't keep asking for forgiveness for something without trying to stop. And I think that's all the Lord wants is for us to be fighting it. We will lose that battle on occasion but keep trying. Don't give up. The Lord is there and the Lord will help. I think the other thing we see is contriteness. Think about Ahab. Of all people, proud Ahab humbled himself, sackcloth and ashes, and he was forgiven. And that's the attitude we need to have. We need to humble ourselves in God's eyes, but I think as important, Humble ourselves in our own eyes. In Psalm 51, verse 17, we read, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So we need to humble ourselves. And when we think of our sins and pray for forgiveness, when we realize that that was worthy of death, I think it will help us the next time that sin crops up. And then if you look at 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, and I'll read this to you. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And and here's the difference. The difference lies in our belief and hope in God. See, people in the world, even mass murderers are sorry sometimes of what they've done. People in the world are sorry when they've done wrong. But they stop there. Only God can forgive and heal. It's the second phase. It's not just being sorry, but turning to the Lord for forgiveness and then trying not to do it again. The Amplified renders that worldly grief, hopeless sorrow is deadly, breeding and ending with death. So the world does things wrong. They may be sorry about it, but if you don't turn back to the Lord, the end is death. And even Manasseh, think of this, Manasseh, pagan, could turn back to God and be forgiven and restored. And then we've already touched on this when we talk about repentance. It's forgiving others, thinking and remembering that God has saved us from death. And how could you not forgive someone else? And even more personal, because sometimes it it sounds easy to say, Sometimes there's somebody we really may have a problem with. Is it really worth losing your place in the kingdom because you can't forgive someone? You 
You know, in our minds, we think of judgment as being a long, drawn-out affair. But in reality, I think when Jesus returns, judgment may happen quickly. And I think part of that is because we're being looked at and judged now. Right now, this morning, we are told, even though we're in households spread across North America, but we're meeting in his name, that Jesus is walking between the candlesticks. He's walking through the ecclesias. And what's he say? I know thy works. And that phrase keeps coming up. I know, I know thy works. Jesus is, act, Jesus is active. He's looking, he's searching. And that word searcheth used in Revelations 2, 23 means active. It means it's happening now. So as you listen to me, think that this is the time to improve, to look at things we need to work on and to improve them now. I think it's helpful to, that when we sit here, especially on a Sunday morning, to realize we're with our Lord and he's searching our hearts and our desires. He's looking at the hidden things that we hide from others, and he sees them. They're, they're opened. They're visible to him. And so, especially on a Sunday morning for myself, it's a time to reflect and, and a special time to pray for forgiveness. Like Manasseh or Saul, our worst sins can be washed away. And, and I know this theme has come up a number of times this weekend, but I know people who believe they probably won't be in the kingdom. I know people who still feel like they won't be forgiven. And it's just frustrating. We need to believe. We need to trust. Just think of men like Manasseh and Saul. Now, we know that our purpose isn't in life to exist so God can forgive us. Uh, Brother James was talking about seeing the young ones behind his house. And sometimes we think of it this way, as we're a little child, a toddler who's fallen, and we go over and we pick him up, pat him on the backside and say, off you go. And sometimes we think our life in the truth is that, that we're here and God forgives us and we just move on. Something John Thomas wrote, and I, I know you know this, but the context is really important. God manifestation, not human salvation. It's not our purpose in life just to live and be forgiven and keep going on and doing the same things. God picks us up and sends us on our way with the hope that we're more like him and his son that his character is being instilled in us. And we need to do the instilling. We need to put God's word in our heart. You know, it took Manasseh, and, and you can imagine him in, in torture and bonds and chains in Babylon, until he remembered his father, remembered the lessons of repentance and the mercy of God, and he changed. I mean, literally, he changed 180 degrees. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. And I'll read it for you. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So like Peter or Paul or Rehoboam, Jehoshaphat, Manasseh, all of us have been redeemed from our former useless way of life, as scripture puts it. 
And that word holy, we know, means to be set apart, to be used for God's purpose. And that word perfect doesn't mean perfect, but mature, undivided in your loyalties. And it took Manasseh a lifetime to realize that. But when he turns back to God, God was there. And I think it's interesting, again, to turn back to the prophet of Manasseh, Habakkuk. If we read Habakkuk 3, starting at 17. And again, I'm going to read this from the Amplified because I think it really brings the richness out of the verses. Habakkuk 3, starting at 17. And I know we know this. We have a hymn based on this. Though the fig tree does not blossom, there's no fruit on the vines. Though the product of the olive fails and the fields yield no, no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no cattle in the stalls. So here's Habakkuk just seeing the worst in everything under Manasseh. But it continues. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the victorious God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, my personal bravery, my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk and not to stand still in terror, but to walk and to make spiritual progress upon my high places of suffering or responsibility. And that really is a good judgment of how we live in a world full of evil and where our trust should be. In Ephesians 5, 15, another familiar verse to us, Ephesians 5, verse 15, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. It's ironic. I can't imagine it being more evil than in the days of Manasseh. And they were evil because of Manasseh. And here he is trying to undo it. You know, the AV is a little bit misleading, and I think it really helps to understand this. The days are evil. And the impression we have is we're to try to put this right, that that it's just so wrong and dirty. Maybe that's a good way to put it. It's just so dirty. We don't want to touch it, that we hate it. We have no compassion on it. But, but think of it this way. The evil world that Habakkuk lived in and the evil world, brothers and sisters, we're living in right now. The word really means diseased. It means sick. It means ill. It means it's need in need of, of healing. And when you think of somebody who needs healing, it changes your perspective. We could hate sinners like Manasseh. But really, we should think of Manasseh as somebody that needs God's love and God's healing. And if we had viewed Manasseh that way, it kind of changes our perspective. Poor Manasseh, in a sense, was sick and needed God more than anything. We live in a sick society, but we need to think more in terms that this world needs to be healed. And we think that way, I think our outlook on the world changes in a better perspective, a better way. We need compassion, not condemnation. And that word walk circumspectly that Paul uses in Ephesians 5 means to be diligent, to leave no stone unturned, to make the most of your opportunities. You know, and I don't know how the truth is preached where your ecclesias are. We've done everything in our own ecclesia. Uh, and we did all kinds, even high-tech things. And I remember once we had done all the usual things, all the usual advertising, and a sister said, well, 
why don't we just go door to door and hand leaflets out? Do some bill pushing. And, and I don't know about you, but we haven't pushed flyers and leaflets since I was a teenager. It never seemed effective. But she suggested this, and we did it. And because we handed out leaflets door to door, four people came as a result of that. That's leaving no stone unturned, doing whatever you can, making the most of your opportunities. That's what redeeming the time means. Doing your best. The word redeem also means, and it's really important in this context, it means to rescue from loss. Think of the number of billions of people, 7.9 billion people that could be lost. Think of the people in your town, your neighbors. Are you going to rescue them from loss? Instead of seeing them as deserving the punishments they have, I don't know if anybody of us would ever think that, but to look at them with compassion that they're drowning. Imagine you're in the boat and you can make it to them before they drown. We need to paddle. We need to rescue from loss. Our, our neighbors, our coworkers, those we meet in the world. And it's interesting that that phrase, rescue from loss, occurs in two other places in scripture. And do you know what? It applies to you. These two times are Jesus redeeming us. It's Galatians 3.13 and Galatians 4.5. Jesus did everything he could to rescue you from loss. And you think about it. Jesus never missed an opportunity. He sailed across the Galilee to save one person, to rescue from loss. And I think Manasseh had that mindset at the end of his life when he changed, that he tried to undo and to save all those who he had led astray. Now, Manasseh's change was really, really dramatic, 180 degrees. And I doubt anybody listening today needs to change that much like Manasseh. And I'd just like to talk before we close about change. And I want to start with a, a lesson I had learned from that book I mentioned yesterday. Uh, it's called The Atomic Habit by James Clear. And I actually heard it. Uh, I've never read the book before, although it was a bestseller. And he has a couple really good things in it that I think are helpful. Now, if you just give me a sec, we all know what the Tour de France is, correct? It's a bike ride in France, and, and it takes a lot to win this very difficult race. Now, let me read to you very briefly, but on my phone, I have it. Let's look at the winners of the Tour de France from the beginning. And I believe it's 1903 is when it started. Well, we have France, 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 Luxembourg, France, Belgium, World War II, Belgium a number of times, France and Italy, and then another long streak of France to World War II, a few blanks there, France, Italy, Italy, France again, Italy. You kind of get the idea where I'm going, Belgium, France, France. We got a number of years where the United States had one, but they had cheated 1999 through the 2000s. So they're crossed out. And then Spain, and it, it, it's that list. The one nation you won't see on that list of the Tour de France is Great Britain. In fact, Great Britain had such a bad team that some of the vendors, some of the suppliers wouldn't even supply them equipment. They didn't want people knowing that Great Britain was using their equipment. Now, if, if I finish that list from 2013 through 2018, 
Great Britain became a powerhouse. Almost consecutively, except for one year, they won. And you think, how could a team that's competed from 1903 to 2013 change to become a winning team? They never won before. And now they're winning. And unlike the United States, they're winning because they weren't cheating. They did something different. And here's where I think it's helpful for us. Sometimes we have to be wise like the children of the world and apply some lessons that they have spiritually. And we, we talked about that yesterday. Usually it's done in the business world where they take spiritual lessons and make it business lessons. AA does that to help rehab alcoholics. So Great Britain never won. What did they do to change? Well, they hired this coach named Dave Brailsford. And his goal, his philosophy to win the Tour de France was change, but small changes. In fact, this coach, his, his goal wasn't just to win it once. You know, I don't know if you follow sports, but sometimes a team will do everything to win the trophy once. They'll trade, they'll spend whatever they can to put the best team on the field so they can just win once. Well, the team in Great Britain, their philosophy was if we change enough, winning will just be a natural result. We're not just winning it for one year. We want a system in place to keep winning. And, and here's how he did it. And this is where I think it's really important for us. All he did was try to improve everything just by 1%. 1% better in everything. So you think about it. Just do a little better in training. See if you can get a better tire. See if your riders can eat better meals and better snacks. Maybe if the shirts can be made a little more wind resistant to buy them. Even down to how comfortable the pillows were when they were on the road. Better sports drinks, socks. I mean, you can think of it. Everything about a sports team, he just wanted to make 1% better. Now, I can already tell you, if I vacuumed the house 1% more, my, my wife wouldn't notice at all. If I had done the laundry 1% more, if I'd done the dishes 1% more, Chris would never notice. She's smiling. Well, you'll never win the Tour de France because you have a better, better pillow than the other team. But if all aspects of your work, your business of winning, adds up, anything is possible. And all these little tweaks that this man had implemented turned Great Britain into a powerhouse. And again, you wouldn't think 1% changes would make a difference, but they're cumulative. You put an ice cube on the table and the room is 28 degrees and you improve the temperature 1%, it's 29. Well, there's still an ice cube on the table. You increase the temperature to 30, just 1%. The ice cube is still intact. You go to 31, 1% better. There's still an ice cube on your table. You improve the temperature 1% to 32, and you still have an ice cube on the table. But as soon as you raise the temperature to 33, it changes completely. Little changes are cumulative. They make a big difference. Now, I don't think anybody watching wants to win the Tour de France, but we wanna be in the kingdom. We, and, and where I'm getting at, it's not that we just wanna be in the kingdom, but we wanna do more to improve our lives, our family, our ecclesia. We wanna enter the kingdom strongly. And so I thought, what are little tiny changes that we could make? What if just once a week or once a month, you call somebody who's a shut-in, who's in a nursing home. You touch bases with somebody in isolation. 
You pick somebody in need and you help them. Maybe if you read more of the, well, let's start with readings. Maybe just doing a little bit of your daily readings if you're not. And if you are doing your readings, maybe order a book, you know, Tom Graham's library, or, or you have a book on the shelf you bought at Bible school and read that in addition. What if you taught Sunday school, even one, one week filled in? What if you mentioned the truth to just one new person a week? A neighbor, a friend, somebody you meet at the store. One of the headlines in the newspaper about two weeks ago was, Russia and Turkey are going to teach Israel a lesson. And if you saw that on the headline, just to mention to the person, you know what? The Bible talks about this. And it says, before that happens, or when that happens, Christ will return. And then say no more. Just leave it at that. Plant the seed and see if God will bring a harvest from it. One person a week or even a month, it's cumulative. What, what if you just do things, good things for members of the meeting? Uh, help somebody with a meal. Help a, a young mom with her, her children or helping with things around the house. Make cookies for a member of the Ecclesia. Once a month, 1% such a tiny little difference. But in your own life, eventually you will pass the plateau and it will make a real difference. You'll be a reader, you'll be a helper, you'll, you'll be somebody who's more helpful to those in the meeting. It all adds up. And if it's good for you, imagine a whole ecclesia just trying to be 1% better. It's not really asking a whole lot, but it makes huge differences. If you see yourself as a saint in God's kingdom, make these little changes. Just sit down and, and pick one of them, or you'll think of something different, and just try it and be consistent with it. And then maybe make another 1% change in something else in life. And all these individual pieces and, and things you do will add up. Pray more often. Do your readings. Send a text to a friend in need. There are so many brothers and sisters in need today. Just pick one of them and pray for them throughout the day. And it will make a difference. So start doing one thing. You know, Jesus said, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part. It was just one little tweak. The meal was almost ready, and she felt she could sit down and listen to the Lord, right? Or, or she just chose that it was more important for that day, that meal, that one hour of time out of 24 to listen to the Lord's teaching. Paul says, this one thing I do. He also says, do not be ignorant of this one thing. Pay attention to it. And finally, Jesus says, thou lackest one thing. So to close our Sunday school, we'll, we'll be talking about the judges for the exhortation. But think about the change that Manasseh worked in his own life, completely opposite. And then in your own lives, brothers and sisters, Think about a small change that you can make and then make it.